Good afternoon, I'm Stacey Akahoshi and a member of the AZLA Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee is partnering with the Professional Development Committee for this first in a quarterly series of professional opportunities for members to increase knowledge, skills and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. <clears throat> this session is being recorded. And the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. The link will be provided in your follow-up email. Patricia Jimenez will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via chat as the Arizona Library Association um, uh, name. Um, if you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is very important to us. And then um, for more membership info, I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an AZLA Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. And then also please support AZLA when you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through Amazon Smile Portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases to the Arizona Library Association. All right, and I would like to thank you all for attending today. Um, please welcome Mandy Harris and Denise Neuter for their presentation, Surviving and Thriving, through library challenges to Idaho librarians' experiences. All right. All right. All right. So this is Surviving and Thriving Through Library Challenges to Idaho Librarians Experience um, with Denise and Mandy. This is a diversity, equity, inclusion webinar. Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today, our objectives are to talk about the challenges faced by public libraries today. Um, our presenters will share the challenges they have faced at their public libraries in Idaho. We're going to talk about best practices on how to deal with those types of challenges, um, what to do when you're faced with them, the partnerships and support you should seek out, and the mental health and self-care resources that they recommend. And then we will talk a little bit about just how we see um, their communities moving forward and the best way that this is going to happen and what they expect to experience in the near future. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let Denise um, go ahead and introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to AZLA and to the EDI committee for having us and, and asking us to present today. Uh, my name is Denise Newyear. Pronouns are she, her. And I work for the Community Library Network here in North Idaho. Uh, we have seven libraries and a bookmobile and a discovery bus. Um, and I am the district young adult librarian um, for our libraries. So um, basically, I loved my, my library growing up in my hometown of Whittier, California. And I looked up to my children's librarian. I volunteered seven summers um, in the library. I just loved it so much. And um, then I decided in college to pursue a career in child psychology. Um, yeah, I was in denial. Uh, <laughs> and then I wanted to be a casting director. And then I realized that my, my path was to be a children's librarian. Um, so I really enjoy that. I think it's such an important um, career to have. Um, of course, books are wonderful, but it's just great to have a safe and welcoming place for everyone in our community. Um, and I really love connecting to the community. 
Um, so in the pictures that you see here on the right in the corner there, um, some of my library family, we were at the Coeur d'Alene um, annual Pride in the Park event. That is our booth there. Uh, and you will also see my lovely cat Salem with a sign behind him. And uh, that sign I use, um, I've used it at a LGBTQ plus youth rally. I've used it at trans remembrance events and also a lot of the times at my programs um, for the teens and when we have protesters, which we can talk about later, but um, that sign has seen a lot. So, but thank you so much for having me. All right. And next up, we have Mandy Harris. Mandy, are you back on the call with us? I um, Can you hear me, Stacey? You're kind of breaking up. Do you want me to do your introduction? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, would you, oh, better, better. Okay, my apologies, everyone. At about 9.58, when I was logged on, um, the power went out to the entire house, including, uh, that included the internet. So I quickly logged on on my phone. So my apologies, but you know, like all good librarians, we pivot. When things don't go uh, the way we expect them to do, uh, we pivot. And Stacey, just let me know if I'm breaking up too much <laughs> as I'm on my phone here. So, Siona Mandy Harris, Dawadon. Hello, friends. My name is Mandy Harris. I am a citizen of Cherokee Nation. I am currently a PhD student in information science at the University of Washington. I am headed into my second year in the PhD program. Prior to coming here, I had about 10 years of experience working, including at the Community Library Network, where I met Denise. I was lucky enough to work with Denise and learn from her and experience all of her wisdom and brilliance for several years when I got my start at the Community Library Network work where I primarily worked out of the Hayden branch. And I have a picture here of Denise and me at um, Coeur d'Alene Pride in the park in 2019. And I also included a picture of um, my cat, Flora, when I saw that Denise had included a picture of Salem. I included a picture of Flora to show our matching cats. Um, the pictures that you see on the screen here, um, the one in the upper left hand corner, I'm addressed as Indigenous Wonder Woman. I came back to the Coeur d'Alene Library this summer. Prior to being at the PhD program, I was the head of youth services for Coeur d'Alene Public Library in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, and they were kind enough to let me come back and volunteer at some story times this summer. And since I had a picture of Denise and me, um, I was lucky enough to meet Stacy about five years ago. And again, I've learned from her brilliance, wisdom and experience. And I wanted to include these pictures of Denise and Stacy on here because the only way we make it through challenging times is with community. And we're all in multiple communities at the same time. And so these are two of the brilliant librarians I get to be in community with. So thank you for having me today. Awesome, thank you, Mandy. And um, we might be experiencing technical difficulties um, with the power outage at Mandy's house. So if you are unable to hear anything that she said or there's any issues, just please let me know in the chat. Um, I am able to kind of fill in some of the info for her um, in some of the things in case it cuts out again. So just let me know if you have any questions in the chat. We're happy to talk about them again or repeat ourselves. <clears throat> All right, so um, we start every AZLA EDI committee webinar or training with a solidarity statement. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read this out. The AZLA EDI committee stands in solidarity with all racialized, queer, disabled, and oppressed people in library communities across Arizona and in the United States. We oppose the ongoing violence against Black, Jewish, Asian, Indigenous, and all marginalized communities, as well as nationwide legal attacks against women, queer, and trans people. These hateful events are in direct contradiction to the ideals of a democratic and just society. Libraries in particular have the capacity to provide equitable and inclusive spaces programs and knowledge, which supports marginalized people. We call on our libraries to take action to bring thoughtful social justice oriented interventions into practice for the benefit of library members, as well as library workers, students and volunteers. 
Thank you. All right. Um, so up next is going to be our land acknowledgements. Um, AZLA is currently working with Indigenous librarians and partners to develop a land statement. So we don't have an official AZLA one. However, we will be acknowledging the traditional caretakers whose land we are on as our presenters. We encourage all participants to recognize whose land they occupy over in the chat. Um, please go ahead and add it. We will also share some resources soon on how to look that up if you are unsure. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I am currently in Sun Lakes, Arizona, which is, um, let me go ahead and look here, which is in the um, Salt River Valley on the ancestral territories of the indigenous peoples, including the Akime, Oham, and Peeposh Maricopa Indian communities. Um, and then Mandy, who cut out again. I am just going to double check here to see if she's able to come back in. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up Denise and Mandy's land acknowledgement so I can go ahead and get those out. I don't, oh, Mandy, are you back? I am back. Can you hear me better now? Yes, we can hear you better. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. My apologies, everyone. Um, and I'm going to leave my camera off because I'm running off of my phone's hotspot right now. Um, so my apologies. Thanks for your patience. The power suddenly went out at my house at 958, which included the internet. Um, and so are you ready for me to... For a land acknowledgement? Yes, please. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you, Stacey. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, Denise and I are currently on the land of the Stitzwumps people, so of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, and we acknowledge the traditional lands of the Stitzwumps people. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about land acknowledgements and how libraries can be part partners to the traditional caretakers of the lands that we are on. And Stacy, if you would go. Thank you. Um, it, it's very important to acknowledge and recognize the traditional caretakers of the lands that we are on. As a citizen of my tribal nation, I recognize that I am um, an uninvited guest on Stitzwamp's land when I'm here in North Idaho and an uninvited guest on unceded Duwamish land when I am. So it's very important to acknowledge and recognize and walk with humility on the lands of the traditional caretakers that we are on. If you would like to learn more about creating your own land acknowledgement, then I encourage you to check out these resources that we have here. But one thing about land acknowledgements is it's important to go beyond words and to see how we can partner with tribal organizations to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who work in our libraries and who come into our libraries as patron patrons. And so you're taking important action by being here today because many of the books that are on the banned and challenged lists are by indigenous authors. So by guaranteeing these fundamental rights to read and to have inclusivity and diversity in our libraries, then we can take action beyond mere words to show that we are partnering and acknowledging the people who have guarded
All right, so it sounds like Mandy cut out, um, but she was saying that we want to acknowledge and we want to um, ensure that we're helping the people who have guarded the land for centuries. And let's see if she's able to come back in before I move on. Maybe. My apologies, can you hear me now? Yes. I am so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Um, and so if you would like to learn more about not just offering land acknowledgements, but truly crafting a land acknowledgement that you are co-creating with those who are the traditional landholder landholders whose lands you currently occupy, then I can I recommend checking out these resources. And I also recommend everyone become members of the American Indian Library Association. It is a wonderful group and you will um, learn from the many brilliant indigenous librarians uh, that we have here on the lands that are now known as the United States. Um, we have a resource here from Native Governance, which is a guide to land acknowledgements and um, how to go beyond. As I mentioned, it's important to go beyond a land acknowledgement. Um, those are important words that you should be co-creating and co-crafting with the traditional landholders um, whose lands you currently occupy. Um, but it's important to go beyond that and to provide. And with October coming up with Indigenous Peoples Day and with November coming up with Native, Her Native American Heritage Month, I would encourage everyone to remember that we can think beyond November. And we can incorporate Indigenous peoples into our programming all year round. So you can read Zelena Gonzalez's All Around Us. Um, oh, is the sound still not You're kind of trailing off. You're breaking up a little bit now. <laughs> I just... Can you, can, is everybody able to hear me? Yes. <laughs> Mandy, thank you for heading into the chat and typing out everything. Um, just so everybody knows, all of these resources that are on the screen right now will be um, not only in our slides when we send those out, but there's also a resource handout that we have that should be coming with your follow-up emails. Um, so you will have all the links to these great resources that we have put together. Oh my gosh, you're even hooking up a generator. Thank you so much for working through this, Mandy. We definitely appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and continue on. I knew you're just gonna kind of sum up your, um, your points there in the chat. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, and thank you so much for everybody being so flexible. All right, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about is what are some of the challenges that you and your community are facing? Okay, so I know that many, many libraries um, around our country are struggling with this, especially in the last year. So I'm so glad that we're able to discuss this today. Um, in our library district, we've had book challenges. We've also had program challenges. So I'm just going to touch on both of those and, and kind of share our experiences. Um, so as far as books go, we have received um, some complaints about books at our library board meetings. Um, pretty much a specific group of people that come to all our meetings and um, voice their opinions. Usually, most of them have been about LGBTQ plus um, books that are in our YA section as well as our children's section. Um, some of these books we don't actually own in our district, but they do want to share their opinions. Um, we did have three formal complaints on the books. Uh, Something happened in our town, George and Jack, not Jackie. Um, so for those particular ones, since those were formal complaints with paperwork and all the things, um, we had a very extensive and professional review by a group of librarians to make sure, you know, that these books should be on our shelves. Um, all three did remain on our shelves, and um, but they, it went through a very extensive process to make sure that, um, you know, we were listening to the people that, that gave these complaints. 
Um, we have had accusations, many, of having pornography on our shelves. Um, you know, their three-year-old will randomly find these books on the shelf and start reading it. Pretty smart three-year-old to be reading. Um, and then uh, parents are just too busy to know what their children are reading. Um, and then we also always hear about, you know, taxes are paying for these books, um, but everybody pays taxes. So we want to make sure we have books for everyone in our community. Um, in our collection, we have about a thousand, a little bit over a thousand items um, district wide uh, that are LGBTQ plus related. Um, so not very many, um, you know, at, out of the thousands and thousands of books in our collection. Um, so I am going to talk a bit about our programs now. So in 2019, uh, we started a group for sixth through 12th graders called Rainbow Squad. And Rainbow Squad is a program for LGBTQ plus youth and allies just to get together. Um, they make crafts, they play games, um, they eat snacks, <laughs> and they sport their rainbow flags, and they're just, you know, happy to be themselves. Um, so we've been doing this, like I said, this is our fourth year, um, and it's been a really successful program. Um, we do have quite a bit of teens that, that attend. Last year, we also started a Rainbow Squad Parent Edition program uh, where parents could get together at the same time on the opposite side of the library. They could chat um, and have snacks as well, of course. Um, but, you know, just to have a network of people to talk to. We started having protesters in November of 21. Um, and it was, it was difficult, obviously, because we, well, we weren't expecting protesters, um, but also they were right at the entrance on either side where the kids were entering the building. Um, we do Rainbow Squad after hours at the library and teens need to register. So it is not open to the public, the library, but um, just for this particular program after hours. Um, but these particular protesters were on either side of the teens, and it was really, really hard on them, um, you know, to be in such, such an environment. Um, so we talked to our attorney, the police, different people, and we came up with a new policy, because we had never had protesters before, um, to have a 25-foot rule from our entrance. So protesters had to be 25 feet from our, our doors, um, you know, they're welcome to exercise their um, freedom of speech, but 25 feet, please. And so um, we had that in place by our next program in December, um, which was wonderful. So we had that. We also emailed the teens to let them know they could come through the employee door if they felt intimidated or scared or didn't want to go through, um, you know, past the protesters. Um, so in December, um, there was a gentleman that did not want to comply to the 25 foot rule and um, had words with the police. He was arrested and they did find um, a loaded gun on him and a knife, um, but he is banned from our libraries for a year. Um, so there's that. Um, we did have, um, we haven't seen protesters since December until this last Saturday, um, they came back. And um, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been hard on the teens and, and staff as well. Um, but we can talk a little bit more about how to deal with, with those situations later. Um, so I also want to mention that we've partnered with North Idaho Pride Alliance for the past five years, and we've um, had a booth or a presentation at all of their Pride in the Park celebrations um, every year for Pride Month, which has been a really great, great thing. Um, this year, was different. Um, many of you may have seen in the news about the U-Haul situation and the men that came out of it, um, but they were stopped before they reached us. So that is wonderful. Our police department, we're very grateful to them. Um, but, you know, we had emails and calls and it was, it was hard. Um, we also did a, a kids pride celebration this summer for elementary age-ish. Um, so just for families to come and enjoy crafts, um, science experiments, all about rainbows, we gave free books out. And there was a flyer that went out uh, with my name on it and my email um, with some untrue things that we were doing at this program um, from this particular group of people in our community that decided to send these flyers out and put them on cars and social media. Um, and it also had my the partners from North Idaho Pride, Pride Alliance and Human Rights Institute on there as well. 
um, so that we were targeting children and, and all these terrible things. Um, so basically in the last year, you know, um, as library staff, we've been called many things. Um, we've been called groomers, pedophiles, um, that we're spreading perversion and giving out pornography. Uh, we were even told that we are recruiting children, teens to, to be uh, gay, to be LGBTQ, and then so they could be prostitutes and that we could harvest their organs. Um, we've been told we are parading toddlers, performing unbaptisms. So these are some of the things that we've been told in the last year um, that's just been really hard um, to, to hear and to deal with. Um, but the beautiful thing that came out of all of that from the last year is there has been such an outpouring of love from the community and positivity. Um, so many people have, you know, talked to us personally on social media, have given us emails, um, made many donations to Rainbow Squad, which has been so nice. Um, but, you know, it's as hard as it is to go through all this negative, you know, and all the challenges and all the things, um, there is a silver lining sometimes like the the people that come out and show their love and their um you know that they understand that libraries are an inclusive place um welcoming to everybody so those were some of the things we have faced this last year um denise i do have a question that i kind of want you to answer in this section right now um the question is has the community been supportive of the library i know you just kind of shared a little bit about people being supportive of that specific program um when you're facing book challenges and things like that what is that like um, yeah so you know i think a large portion of our community is um is you know supporting us is positive about everything, loves the library, appreciates the library. Um, the people that are, you know, protesting and complaining about books and things, it is, I believe, the same people. <laughs> it's like this a small, small groups in our community, but they're really loud. So they seem like they're more people than they actually are. Um, but you know, a lot of people may not agree, but they understand that we need books for everyone. Um, and they just don't check them out. But there are people that don't be that believe that no one should check them out. So um, I do believe that group is a lot smaller in our community, a lot smaller. So that's encouraging. Okay, awesome. Um, I am going to uh, read out Mandy's um, answer here. Sorry, I just. Do you want me to try, Denise? Yeah, go ahead and try, Mandy. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so one challenge that, another challenge that I noticed, and I experienced this in um, conversations with many of my long-term families, is that this area in North Idaho, specifically Coeur d'Alene, Hayden, Post Falls, um, during the pandemic became one of the fastest growing areas um, in the nation. And so that meant that long-term families, a lot of them were priced out rental prices went up, they couldn't afford to stay here. And many new families moved into the area. And as many of you know, it takes time to build trust and your families um, get to know you, they trust you, there's that relationship. Um, but when you have so many people moving into the area who expect Idaho to be one way, and then they encounter in their library, in their community, this unexpected diversity, I, I think it contributes to a sense of shock um, among these and they are who become some of the loudest voices. I know in the formal challenge that I experienced during my time in Coeur d'Alene, it was a number of families, um, it was a number of families who had only moved into the area within the past year. And part of when they came they presented to their board, the board with their formal challenge, they said they were shocked to discover that part of their shock is these preconceived notions of what a red state should look like. Um, and so I do think that also is contributing to these challenges. And I want to also echo what Denise said about these voices are the loudest, um, but they're not necessarily the majority of the voices. And I also work for years and um, just their steadfastness and the resolve in showing support um, to marginalized communities within North Idaho has been phenomenal. And I think they, um, they deserve their flowers for this. Thank 
Thank you, Mandy. Uh, we were able to get through that. All right. Um, so this week is Band Books Week. Um, so what is that like in your community? What has it been like in the past? Um, are there different ways that you are celebrating the freedom to read, but you're facing these huge challenges? It's been a hot topic for many, many, many months. Um, it's not like a week anymore. It's um, something that you're constantly doing. So um, how do you do that, Denise? Yeah, so, you know, Banned Books Week has been celebrated nationally in our libraries since 1982. <laughs> so it's not new. <laughs> Some people might think it is. It is not new. Um, so, you know, I think it's a great reminder um, just how divisive censorship is. Um, it's it's a good thing to point out books um, and why they were banned or challenged. And, you know, what do you think of that? And to remind everyone that everyone has the freedom to read whatever whatever they'd like. Um, so I think it's a great time to focus on our purpose as librarians um, and what libraries stand for. Everyone deserves to see themselves in a book. Um, we don't believe in censorship and we leave it up to people to decide what they get to read. Um, so we, we are doing displays, you know, in our libraries. Um, my coworker made this really cool uh, scavenger hunt on banned books. Um, mostly like children's books. And um, she put little bookmarks in them to say why they were being banned or challenged. Um, it definitely feels different this year having those out. I am not gonna lie. We, we are gonna celebrate it like we have always celebrated it every single September, um, but it does feel different. And every time I see someone stop and look at the displays, I wonder, what are they thinking? <laughs> are they? you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, we're just carrying on, like I said, focusing on our purpose. And, and that has really helped, I think. So. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Denise. Um, Mandy, did you have anything to add? Um, yes. So one of my favorite um, one of my favorite quotes is by Radine Sims Bishop, and it's that books can be windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And so each person who comes into the library deserves access to each one of those facets in a book, whether it's seeing a book as a mirror and they're reflected back at that book, or it's seeing a book as a window or a sliding glass door when they can access another viewpoint. And books are fundamental for building self-esteem um, by serving as mirrors. And they're also fundamental for building empathy when they're used as windows and sliding glass doors. And so as Denise said, Band Books Week is nothing new. It's a continued celebration of the diversity and wisdom that can be found in all books. And it's a fundamental expression of our First Amendment rights. And so, you know, you have the right to read whatever you want to read. You have the right to not read there are so many books I haven't read and probably I'm not going to read. I, we all have the right to read anything we want and to not read anything. But where that right ends is in determining what somebody else can read. And so banned books is a celebration of our ability to determine for ourselves the information that we want to access. Awesome. All right. Up next is some of the best practices for the challenges that you have faced. And what is, what do you do? Okay, so the first thing is great to have a plan. Um, so, you know, talk to your administration, your supervisors, your staff, um, your attorney, if you need to. Um, you know, we're really fortunate in our network of libraries where I work. Um, our administration supervisors are so supportive and so wonderful. Um, most of our library board supports us. Um, so, you know, that's been really great, but talking to them coming up, like, for example, when I said we came up with that 25 foot policy for protesters, you know, those kind of things, just have a plan. What will you do if these things were to happen? Um, so, you know, um, just have policies set up if you need it um, and remain calm. <laughs> I. 
So it's hard. It is. Um, I always try to kill people with kindness. That has been my thing that I've learned in the last months. Um, because people get very argumentative, they very emotional, you know, we're all very passionate about what we're believing. And, you know, if you listen, and you're just super kind, uh, it usually catches them off guard, <laughs> and calms them, um, it doesn't escalate. Um, but that being said, it is not always easy. Uh, this last Saturday, we had protesters. And I was not killing them with kindness, <laughs> per se, um, my adrenaline kicked in. And, you know, maybe I talked a little more than I needed to nothing inappropriate or, uh, you know, but I did talk a little more to the protesters than need be. Um, and, you know, you just sometimes need to take a breath and calm <laughs> um, and not engage. It's just that is our big thing. Try not to engage, um, you know, listen, they want to be listened to make them feel like they're so important and we need to hear what they have to say, even if we don't agree. Um, also, you know, take just, yeah, just, I, I don't know. I did want to mention one thing real quickly too. I do appreciate, cause I want to say some of our staff have their own beliefs that are different from, um, you know, my beliefs. Um, and so they may not religiously, politically, you know, agree with things, but you would not know it. They understand that working at a library, we are here for the whole community. They treat everyone with kindness, help everyone the same. Um, so you wouldn't know, you know, what their actual beliefs are. But I do want to say, you know, we're not just all the same. Um, we do have our, our different things and that's okay. Um, but we all get along and we're here for the community. So. Um. And then I wanted to jump in there about the remain calm and then the know your why, that last facet. First with remain calm. And Denise and I, we've talked about this and Stacy and I have too. There's being in the moment with the challenges and then there's the emotional aftermath of that. So you have your plan, you have your policies and perhaps you, you know, execute it perfectly. Or perhaps you feel like Denise said later, like just said, you know, maybe later you might feel like, oh, my adrenaline kicked in and I talked a little bit too much. It's important to care for yourself also in the aftermath. I remember the first time I was told I was indoctrinating children. So, you know, prior to COVID, one of my favorite moments was a mom telling me, oh, Miss Mandy, we love bringing our kids to your story times because you love our children as much as we do. And that I carried that around. I thought, oh my goodness, that's exactly how I want to make patrons feel. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, somebody said, well, you're just, indoctrinating our children and that happened on a Friday and I spent the whole weekend it happened in the summer the whole weekend sitting outside on a chair just staring off into the distance um, not crying just absolutely numb and I just felt it shook my view of who I was if my patrons felt that I was indoctrinating their children I had to re-examine how much of my identity in my life I built around being a children's librarian so you do have to have a plan also for self-care after. And if nobody can hear me, I'll type this in the chat as well. Oh, perfect, perfect. I'm watching Denise and Stacy's faces for clues. Um, and so have also as part of your plan and your policies, how are you going to care for yourself in the aftermath? Because these are very emotional moments things that you'll examine in the after aftermath where you think well i could have handled that better how should i do this but also have a community of support um it's if it's other librarians that you're reaching out to if it's certain family members if it's friends have a plan for yourself in the aftermath because you can't pour from an empty cup and if you want to be you know with as steadfast as denise and karen have been then you've got to have these ways of supporting yourself and getting through and having a grieving process. I'm a big person about let's let's grieve things. It's not just death that we grieve, but it's it's changes in our perceptions of ourselves and our community and these relationships with our community. So part of remaining calm is, and I know I know it's been commodified, and I know we see it on Instagram on memes all the time, but self-care and how are you going to support yourself and leverage your support system? And then also part of that is community care because we are part of the community. Um, we're not just serving the community, we are serving the community, but we're not external from that community. We live here, we're part of the community. So how are you leveraging your different communities that you're part of? And then also how are you providing support for other librarians in these situations as well? 
And then also for Know Your Why, um, we, uh, we're here, we believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it should be a thread that runs throughout all of our collection development and all of our programming. Um, like I was trying to say during my land acknowledgement slide where I was breaking in and out, you know, um, Native Americans, we exist all year round, not just in November. It should be a thread that runs throughout everything. So knowing your why, why you believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice. Um, but also know your why as part of your policy and your plan. So when I had formal book challenges or other challenges, soft censorship that happened, I could say, well, this book was a starred review in School Library Journal, and it was a starred review in Kirkus. And um, this book won um, an American Indian Youth Literature Award. That's why we have it. So know your why in that you can point to these solid reasons why this book is in your collection um, and to justify your collection development, whether that's awards, whether that's starred reviews. Okay, partnerships. Um, just real quick, uh, obviously your own admin staff, um, library board, um, you know, partnering with your police department, just all being on the same page and talking, hopefully they can be a, of help. Um, the North Idaho Pride Alliance and the Human Rights Education Institute has been extremely um, beneficial, just wonderful partners in our local community. Um, they both, you know, uh, share people's lived experiences. They have educational and fun events for people in the community, and they have been just wonderful. Um, local nonprofits, um, and also schools, a lot of um, gender sexuality alliances at your local universities, as well as high schools are great to partner with. Um, and just, you know, any other um, human rights organizations in your area. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, ones in Arizona. So. And then at the bottom, you'll see the Diverse Book Finder, which is a fantastic resource. It, um, if you're looking for books from different communities, different Native nations, um, you can leverage these partnerships, community partnerships, but also you can use, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can use these existing resources that are already out there in order to diversify your collection and make sure that everyone in your community is being represented. And um, I'm lucky enough to be part of the Diverse Book Finders Metadata Community of Practice. So I know how much work goes into evaluating these books and making sure that quality, authentic, own voices books are finding their way onto the book finder. Okay, so here are some of the awesome partnerships you could have in Arizona. I know not everyone's in Phoenix. <laughs> Arizona is a huge state, um, but uh, here are some great ones you can contact if you have questions, need resources, ideas. Um, I've been subscribed to the one in 10 um, email list for a long time. They have really great things for youth. I really like them a lot. Um, and also, you know, like Listen and PFLAG and all the good things. Um, as well as all the human rights organizations that are in your area. Um, just, yeah, call, reach out. You know, you can do collaborations, you can do cross promotions, um, events together. And it's just really, a really great resource to have all these places. And I know that there's a handout that will have um, the links to access all of these um, for you. Just went in the chat. So check out that handout. There's links to all of those. Um, and we will get that typo fixed. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> um, and yes, there are some of these chapters in Tucson also. Um, some of these also are resources in rural communities. The majority of them were in Maricopa County, and I do know that some of them are, are in Tucson also. Okay, so self care is so important as we talked about mental health. Um, you know, you need to have good health, mentally safe, feel safe um, to do your job, right? Um, so stepping away is okay. I had to stop reading the comments for a while on newspaper, you know, things on social media. Um, we had so many articles. Um, just step away, stop for a little bit. I was getting a little obsessed, quite honestly, like reading the horrible things about us. Um, I had to take a break also for attending library board meetings in person, um, just for my own mental health. Um, I still wanted to know what happened at these meetings, you know, just to be aware, but I just, it's a really, um, it could be a little bit hostile. So I had to take a moment and just step back. Um, I would say breathe, which means for me, you know, whatever it is for you, meditation, essential oils, venting to your friends, 
your poor family <laughs> or coworkers who, you know, are like family a lot of times. Um, journaling, whatever you do to make yourself feel better, do it, you know, and then just focus on um, the importance of our jobs, respecting everyone in the community, um, knowing that you could be that one positive adult in a child or a teen's life. For me, since I work with youth, that is like the most important thing for me to be that positive influence. Um, but yeah, just, you know, take care of yourselves, please. And use your resources in that handout and on these slides, we have a lot of them. Um, so please just remember to use what you have. Also, um, personally, as a supervisor, I'm always recommending the benefits that we offer, ensuring that you know you have job security, you are able to um, step away if you need to. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and let Mandy share a little bit of her story in these resources for mental health. Um, yeah, so uh, just a quick content warning. I'm going to talk about stalking, but when Denise and um, Stacy and I were talking about this, I wanted to share my story because I wanted to share with everybody that I know what it's like to go through things, and I've been through this, so you don't have to. Um, in June 2020, I had to get a restraining order against a man I had not seen in person. Um, for over 10 years. Um, and then I later learned that other, other people that knew him at that time also had to get restraining orders against him. So I have been through this process. Um, I am fine talking about it um, because I don't want anybody to have to learn as they go along in the way that I did. And I think this would be, um, these are helpful resources for anybody dealing with, I saw a question come through about um, swatting, doxing, um, online harassment. So one thing that I did was I joined Delete Me, and there's a link on your resources handout. And this link gives you 20% 20, 20 off your first year of membership. My stalker was able to find out information about me due to online data brokers. Um, he got my cell phone number, my home address, all of this. Um, Delete Me removes that off of data broker sites online. So I pay now probably uh, around $150 a year to keep my information um, off the internet. So if you're concerned about doxing, I highly recommend Delete Me. Um, and this link here gives you 20% off uh, your first year of membership. I do want to, in the interest of full disclosure, this is a link from my account. Um, and so for everybody who signs up, they're going to send me a um, $50 Amazon gift card. I'm not going to keep that. So I wanted to, in the interest of full disclosure, if anybody signs up and Delete Me sends me the um, $50 Amazon gift card, I will be splitting those proceeds between the North Idaho Pride Alliance and Transqueer Pueblo in Arizona. Um, the Stalking Prevention and Awareness Resource Center um, that is linked there as well. This has a lot of great tips for you um, in order to keep yourself safe. Um, get familiar with Arizona's stalking, lab, stalking laws and then the Equity Labs Digital Security Resources also has a lot of fantastic resources for you to um, make a plan, get familiar, know how to protect yourself. We, I have talked a lot and so has Denise about um, self-care and mental health, but one thing I've learned as a stalking and assault survivor is you can't feel mentally safe until your body feels physically safe. So going through these resources, joining Delete Me, um, becoming aware of how to keep yourself safe can make your body feel more regulated, which can help your mental health. Did any of that go through? <laughs> we heard um, this can help your mental health. Yes, by keeping your, um, uh, did any of that, the other go through? Yeah. Uh, oh, perfect, perfect. Yes, so um, helping your body feel physically safe and secure can help your mental health because then your body knows it can relax. All right, awesome. We're gonna go ahead and go to the Q&A. Um, I have some questions here from the chat. So, um, um, thanks with all of your effort with book challenges. Do you often see that challengers really want to have their concerns acknowledged while libraries continue to have resources that encompass many points of view? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody wants to voice, you know, if they want to voice their concerns, we definitely want to take that seriously. Um, you know, whether or not 
we understand it or agree, it's it's really important to listen, you know, to everybody in the community. Um, and you know, when they do those formal complaints, we take that even more seriously. It goes through a whole process that takes many, many weeks, months to do. Um, but it is important, yes, to listen to everybody. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Um, I just Oh, oh, I just wanted to say I have seen a little bit of a shift. Um, so absolutely, I agree. It's important to um, listen to everybody, hear everybody out. And I used to um, be able to more often, um, you know, prior to when I started the PhD program in 2021, when I was at Coeur d'Alene, more often people would, would tell me their concerns and I would say, well, what books are you looking for? And we would get them the books that represented them. And that was enough. They just wanted their concerns heard and to know that they were represented on the shelves. Um, because oftentimes when they didn't see the books that represented them on the shelves, they thought we didn't have them. And really it was, um, they were very popular and they were already checked out. Um, so when I was able to talk them through, but I noticed an increasing number of times, um, especially towards the end when we got more of our formal challenges, this wasn't enough. Um, it, there were there were still those people who just wanted their concerns heard and then to know that they were represented. But there were an increasing number of people who had been given the sheets, the lists that have the titles that they wanted removed. And for them, it was um, the formal challenge is what they wanted. They wanted that removal process and you weren't going to get them off that track. They had a goal and they were there to achieve. Okay. Um, so have you had any actual protests in your library or inside a program? I know you talked about the protests outside of the library, um, different things like that. What ha has any of that come into the library or somebody came into your program and then started protesting inside? Yeah, so the great thing about Rainbow Squad, for example, is it is after hours. Um, it's only for teens and, you know, adults that have had background checks and our staff. Um, so not just anyone can come in. Uh, one of our protesters did ask to use the restroom this last Saturday, sneaky, but no, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, definitely not. Um, so, but yeah, um, so that is great. Um, we did have a program in a park one time with Rainbow Squad, what was like pandemic time, you know, like right when we could sort of have outdoor programs. Um, and, you know, the kids, I had like 30, some of them came with their rainbow flags and they were so excited we were doing you know flower pots and um like eating pop tarts like you know playing games um we had this group of fourth graders come and start chanting and saying terrible things to them um and had their own flags um and then we had adults calling the police that we were just there we weren't doing yeah fourth graders we weren't doing anything at all but having fun and being a group and having rainbow flags and these I saw the adults on the corner they were calling the police trying to get them to have us leave um, and the police never came because we weren't doing anything wrong um, so that was the one that was inside and I, I decided after that day that we would not do outdoor programs because I did not feel that was safe for the teens uh, which is unfortunate because sometimes it's nice to be in the outside you know um, enjoying the sunshine but we could not I didn't want to put them in that position again ever. Um, so now we just do it inside after hours so we don't have to deal with that. Um, and then I also saw that um, Mandy put in the chat that she had an elementary schooler leave notes on LGBTQ picture books that said we don't want these books. So that's the type of protest, you know, Mandy experienced a lot. Um, has the libraries you've worked at redone collection development of challenged material policies or um, redone their um, collection development policies to be more inclusive in response to these challenges or have your policies that you've kind of had um, that always just kind of are um, more open-ended and able you to still um, fight those books um, without having to redo them. You know, um, I really respect our coordinator for technical services. She is amazing. She does so much research and um, she orders things that are just perfect for our community in every way. Um, I don't think our policies have changed because of this. I think we're just, you know, sticking to what we are here for as librarians, as libraries. Um, you know, the ALA's constitution is a huge part, obviously, of what we do. So if we stay strong, 
with those type of policies, which we've always had, um, it hasn't changed. You know, we're always going to have inclusive, diverse books that are for for everyone that they can see themselves in. So, you know, some people don't want that, but that's why we're here. <laughs> um, and um, along with that, um, I know you all talked about your policies and having those things. How do you handle though if somebody is requesting to buy a book and donate or donate the book to the library with misinformation in it? Um, the example utilized in this question is the real Anthony Fauci. Um, many times uh, the customers or patrons will bring up censorship as to why they want to be able to see it on the shelf. So that they're telling us that we're trying to censor um, this material. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we again, refer to our policies that are nicely written that we can share with that patron but it does we we take donations or those type of books that are given to us seriously as well right so we will have our technical services team look at that um you know check reviews in um professional journals check information about the author um check what other libraries have this in their collection, if any. <laughs> um, you know, so we, we go through this whole list of things that are all in our policy and that is how we choose all of our books. Not, you know, we're not, um, you know, treating this book any different than any of the other books. So if it doesn't fit the criteria, you know, um, we're happy to explain why. Um, and then if it does fit some of the criteria and we put it in, um, you know, then it's there. Um, we do weed books <laughs> every, you know, few years. So if it doesn't get checked out, um, it's going to go because of that. But, um, but yeah, we treat it like every other book it goes through the process. So. Yeah. Um, I, and I agree with Denise, um, and knowing your policy is key. When I was at Coeur d'Alene, I was in charge of collection development, um, for all of the children's books in our children's library, which was for ages birth to 12 and knowing your policy is key. We reviewed our policy, um, to make sure it reflected, you know, highly reviewed books and reflected, um, quality information. And, and that's the thing is, especially with nonfiction books, we as librarians, we're not going to put misinformation in our nonfiction section. And they do, um, books ha do have to hold up to a certain standard of qu high quality information. But one thing that I would do also is when I had books that were requested. So for example, somebody uh, requested a book on puberty um, that was from a Christian perspective. And when I read the reviews, I saw reviews from people within that Christian community said, well, no, this book is full of misinformation. So people from within that own community were saying, no, this book isn't, um, I don't recommend this book for these reasons. But then I thought, well, I do have members of my community who are looking for puberty books from a Christian perspective. So let me find ones that aren't filled with misinformation. So this title is, but let me find ones that accurately tell children about their health from this perspective that my community member is looking for. Um, so you can look at the themes in what people are looking for and find them high quality resources that wouldn't contribute to misinformation. Oh, that is awesome. I have one last question. Um, and that is um, in, in pertaining to online harassment or doxing or bullying, et cetera. Um, I know you also experienced this online a bit, um, not just in-person protests, things like that. Um, what has your institutions done to put a stop to it or um, to help you through it? And what do you think we can do to prevent that from happening to other librarians? That was a great question. Um, I do wanna say that, you know, the, the admin team, everyone I work with, my boss, um, have been so supportive, um, very concerned about my mental health and always asking how I'm doing, you know, do I need a break? Like all the things, right? Um, which I really appreciate. Um, we also have access to some psychological services through our, you know, medical care and all that, which is great, like phone numbers to call um, people to see if need be. Um, but yeah, they, they've been really concerned. Um, but, you know, yeah, just constantly asking if I'm okay. I did get security cameras at my house just because of my, my name going out on that flyer, um, just for my own 
you know, it made me feel better. Um, but nothing has happened yet. So that's good. Um, but you know, I, unfortunately these things might happen to other librarians. Um, but you know, like we were talking about earlier, just try to take care of yourself as best you can. Um, stay strong, know that you are here for your communities and you're so important. Um, I know it can be really hard and I've, you know, so many emotions go with it and I've cried so much. <laughs> so, um, you know, I understand, um, but just try your best. And, you know, if, if it's not the best one day, don't beat yourself up, you know, it's, it'll get better. It will. I mean, this is always going to probably be a thing now, but um, I think our role in the community is so important. So know that you're, you're doing awesome. So great for you. <laughs> I'm going to turn off my camera so I can uh, <laughs> uh, be heard. And the other thing, um, so when I made the decision to leave and join the PhD program, I was accepted in January and I didn't decide to go until the deadline, the day it was due four months later, uh, because it took me that long to decide if I should leave my community and what impact I could still have. And I will say that it's okay also to pivot if you find another role where you can continue. So now I've come back um, to Idaho and I'm doing a statewide indigenous Idaho training. And next month I'll be doing Native American Heritage Month story times and grief story times. Um, you can also pivot too, if you need to and look for other opportunities and ways to serve your community. Um, and, or you can um, achieve what Denise and Karen have, which is just this steadfast study um, support and all this experience and wisdom that they have gained as well. Um, and I just want to just express my admiration for them and for all librarians who are making sure that every facet of their community is represented in collection development and programming. All right, awesome. Well, um, Thank you, Mandy and Denise, so much for being with us today. And thank you, everybody, for attending and being here with us. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar, along with the link to the resources and um, these slides. Um, thank you again, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Mandy and Denise, for sharing your stories with us today. If you have any further questions for our presenters or the EDI committee, please email us at edi at azla.org. We will be able to get your questions over to Denise and Mandy also. Um, and we appreciate all your flexibility today, Mandy and Denise and everybody here attending. Um, nobody could have expected a power outage. So um, thank you all again for attending today. If you have any um, suggestions for future EDI committee webinars, please feel free to let us know. We do have a proposal form. If you email us, we can send that out too. <laughs>